In this video, you'll discover the truth about the number one mistake cyclists make when they start to get serious about their cycling training. But first, do you ever wonder why some cyclists seem to effortlessly scale mountains, attacking with so much power and grace, while others burst with speed and power and leave your head spinning as fast as their legs? The answer may lie within their cycling muscle fibers. But what exactly does this mean and why should you care? Well, this is the whole point of this video. The number one mistake affects every cycling decision you make, unlocking your true potential as a cyclist. And now there's a new wave of research unlocking the secrets of individualized training and performance, revealing that a one size fits all approach to cycling is no longer sufficient. In this video, I'm going to redo a presentation I did for Oz Cycling on profiling and rider types. And I'm gonna start with this guy here, the guy in the hat. And it's a quote from him. He's Bill Bowerman, the track coach and co-founder of Nike, who would get his athletes together every year on the first day of practice and deliver this 40 second lecture on the fundamentals of training. You stress an organism, for example, a freshman, and you let it rest. What happens? It responds by overcompensating. It becomes some increment stronger, faster, or more enduring. And that's all training is. You think any damn fool could figure out how to do it. The only trick is finding what works for a specific individual athlete. And this is what I spend a lot of my time coaching doing. So when we talk about individualization or personalization of training, I am always on the hunt for better ways to do it. And one way to start this process is by profiling the athlete. And so why do we profile athletes? We profile athletes to better understand rider strengths and weaknesses, especially for new coached riders, suitability for specific events and to personalize training and recovery. And the first thing that I'm looking at in this process is asking the question of what type of rider are you? For some, it might seem obvious like our mate Bobby Big Legs over here, German track sprinter Robert Forsman, or this guy here, Danish mountain biker turned GC road doper Michael Rasmussen. But these are examples of riders on the extreme edges of rider type. It becomes much harder to profile people that fall into the middle. For example, what about these two? Did they know at this age that they'd go on to win cross races, mountain bike races, time trials, and even hilly stages? Probably not because it's a pretty big ask, but we might be able to get more information to help us here because the current profiling methods do have their limitations. So let's take an example of a current profile limitation, and let's take the power profile, for example. Power is the way I profile athletes, and I've been doing this for years, but one of the issues that I've come across is that it doesn't accurately represent the athlete's strengths and limiters. This particular chart is a good way to see the athlete's values across a power curve, and also compare these values against cyclists to get an idea of the magnitude of their strengths and limiters. But it's not perfect. Power profiles alone have issues such as misrepresenting the rider by only showing results of specific training or one test rather than anything else. And they're not performing the best on the day from fatigue or performance anxiety. It's not going to pick it up either. So consider this athlete. If you had to guess what type of rider they are, would you say road warrior or even a kilo rider. Now, how about this athlete? Would you say that they're a climber, a time trialer, a summit seeker? The punchline is that these are the two same athletes. They're the same person. So I want to look at profiling athletes in another way. And this way is through muscle fiber types from their predominant muscle fiber type. So creating rider types from predominant muscle fiber typing is nothing new. We can see three common categories here that road cyclists are put into. And when thinking about muscle fiber types, this used to be thought of as two distinct categories, slow twitch and fast twitch. 
The truth is muscle fibers exist on a continuum between explosive but easily fatigable and slower but more fatigue resistant. So we can see the likely composition of muscle fiber types across these three categories. Type one, slow twitch, is the red in color. Type 2A, intermediate, are lighter red color, and type 2B, fast twitch, are pale in color and sometimes called white. But why does this matter? Well, a new group of studies has found a way to assess, classify, and use your individual muscle fiber typology to help profile athletes and also help individualize training sessions and loading. And I am the first to admit that muscle fibers aren't the only factors that determine what event you're best suited for and what training you will respond to, but they are useful because we are each predisposed to be better in some events other, rather than others and muscle fibers play a role here. But what we're seeing now is the confirmation that the exact same workout can have drastically different impacts on two riders because of their athlete types. And that's an exciting step in the future of training personalization. And before we get to the first study on how to assess and categorize muscle typology, let's take a look at how muscle type assessment has traditionally been done and why it's always been hard to assess muscle fiber composition because it involves a muscle biopsy which basically involves carving out a small chunk of flesh for analysis. And this is Colin Jackson, a former world championship hurdler, and he's filming for a BBC show called The Making of Me. And let's just have a little look here at exactly what's going on. The stabby thing is not insignificant. It's a sample. The sample will measure one centimeter in length and half a centimeter in diameter. And it's likely to hurt. Athletes aren't going to give up their hard earned muscle. It's, and I personally have backed out of studies because this was part of the process. But this is where the new technique has been developed in the past few years, a non-invasive method for estimating fiber composition that's been developed where all you have to do is lie down on an MRI scanner. The thing is called the muscle talent scan and this technique involves proton magnetic resonance spectros spectroscopy of muscle carnosine content and carnosine was chosen because it acts as a buffering agent to maintain muscle pH and has been correlated to be much higher in type two fibers and associated with relative cross-sectional areas of these fibers. The group from Ghent University in Belgium used this technique to find the muscle fiber typology in world-class cyclists across a range of disciplines and published the results in the Medicine and Science and in Sports and Exercise Journal. We're talking about 80 professional cyclists, BMX, XCO, cyclocross, track, road cyclists, world tour, pro conti, Olympians, you name it, they're in there. So it's a great cross section of these athletes. And if you want to name a big rider, it doesn't get much bigger or more interesting than this guy, Matthew Vanderpool. And I'll get to where he may sit in just a moment, but first a bit more on how they classified the disciplines. So let's look at this chart here. Here is a graph that plots these world-class cyclists with their related carnosine Z-scores. And these Z-scores show the absolute concentration of carnosine compared to a control group of people who are not athletes. On the other side, we have a minus Z score, which is for slower typologies. And on the other side of that, we have a plus score for faster typologies. And going through these, starting at the top left, you can kind of guess what they are and what each rider and discipline represents. So if we kind of skim through these, you can get a clear idea of what they are. Now about Matthew Vanderpool. Where do you think he sits on this chart? Well, I believe all of them it, because he'd mostly overlap so many of them. But now let's get to the practical stuff, the training studies beyond profiling. The authors wanted to see how muscle fiber typology affected recovery from high intensive interval training and these new Z scores. So let's get into the studies. Study one, do athletes with more fast twitch fibers have greater fatigue during a sprint interval session than athletes with more slow twitch fibers? 
So they had 10 trained cyclists with high fast twitch typing and 10 trained cyclists with high slow twitch typing. The intervention was where each group performed three 30 second wind gate all out sprints and five hours following the workout, each athlete performed repeated muscle testing. The results, wind gate results were as expected. The fast twitch group had higher peak power. However, the rate of fatigue was faster in the group over both an individual Wingate sprint and over the course of three Wingates. So already confirming what we know. But here's the cool stuff. The slow twitch and fast groups were dramatically different in how they recovered over the course of five hours. The slow twitch group re recovered to pre-workout levels by 20 minutes, where the fast twitch group was significantly lower than pre-workout levels, even five hours into recovery. In study two, they asked the question, how does each type of athlete respond to volume and what is the risk of functional overreaching? The subjects were 24 elite male and female middle distance runners, 800 meters and 1500 meter specialists. The intervention, over seven weeks, the first three weeks were normal training, followed by one week each of 10%, 20% and 20% of increased volume, and then one week of tapering a 55% decrease from the previous week. Then they tested for neural response or overreached response. And the results of the 24 runners, exactly half of them were categorized as overreached and the other half were fatigued. So there's no big surprises there. The cool stuff. When muscle fiber typology was factored in, the overreached group had a significantly higher estimated proportion of fast twitch fibers than the neural group. So what can we take from these studies? Short-term recovery time following a sprint interval training session is dependent on your muscle fiber typology. If we look at these re practical applications, recovery really needs to be factored into how training sessions are distributed in a week. Fast twitch athletes may require more recovery between workouts given that the recovery between sessions is considerably slower compared to slow twitch athletes. And here's where training philosophy may be important. For fast twitch athletes, when hitting a build phase, a polarized approach may work better when doing these types of efforts. While slow twitch athletes may be able to maintain some threshold or sweet spot training during this same period. In addition to needing extra recovery from individual interval sessions, these data suggests that those with a high proportion of fast twitch fibers may have to be especially careful to avoid huge ramps in training volume and may need to focus on a carefully guided ramp in volume, especially in an overload training block. So what does all this mean? I'll be the first to admit that these results pretty much are what coaches have always thought would happen. The saying is, it's easy to mess up a sprinter has been around a long time. We also know that you don't wanna put sprinters on faster group rides as they just can't handle the fatigue the same way. And the thing here is that now that there's some scientific, scientific evidence to back up the idea that not everyone responds equally to the same training plan and some of the variation is associated with the characteristics of your muscle fibers, this is useful in reducing the time it takes to learn how an athlete will respond to certain types of training, especially for developing athletes or mid-career cyclists, those ones that the riders that have been around a couple of years of riders of any age and they're just beginning to specialize and find out who they are and it's still early days though so i am waiting for the day where i can do this on day one with a new athlete in the meantime i've put a lot of work into identifying rider types as it's the first thing i do with any athletes i work with and then how it impacts different sessions which i have developed over my 10 plus years of coaching I offer this as a standalone service at ridertype.com because after learning about your rider type in detail, it really does change everything. Even if you already know it or you want to ride events different from your strengths, it helps you to know where you are and then you can map out the best way to get to where you want to be. Because it's not all strictly set in stone and unchangeable rider types wouldn't be very useful. We can all change within physical limits of course 
In fact, your rider type can change over time as you improve your fitness and focus on different areas, including the strengths and weaknesses that profiling identifies. And just as I showed in the example, we took that rider from doing so-so in national level events to winning them and getting podiums on some of the biggest races on the calendar. Now, if you're frustrated because you know you can perform better, but are confused about what to do next to improve your cycling performance, knowing exactly where to focus your efforts in training is really important if you don't wanna waste your time. In this video, here, I'm going to show you how to find your gaps in mental and physical skills that are essential for cycling performance so you know exactly what to work on first.